Good day. Welcome to the NPTEL course Advanced Neuroscience for Engineers. Today uh, we have a TA session on the introduction of packaging for neural devices. So uh, Professor Hardik might have um, you know shown you several devices that we fabricate and use for experimental neurophysiology. We work on uh, several devices, electronics, packaging so that uh, these devices can be implanted for long term recording and stimulation in rodent models. Now uh, if you see here we have you know flexible um, devices okay this is a 33 channel uh, flexible device on a polymate substrate then we have 10 channel devices then we have um, you know micro needle arrays which are silicon based for uh, in depth recording or depth electrodes for uh, deeper targets then uh, you know multi shanks of micro needles and things like that. So, e each of these devices comes with its own um, uh, design considerations uh, targeting different brain regions. So, these are, this is a single shank micro needle and then this is a 5 electrode surface neural implant. So, all these devices have its own applications and uh, uh, depending on these applications we have different electronic modules that has to be interfaced along with the implant and also the packaging as well. Now, uh, what am I talking about when it, uh, when I say the term packaging? So, say um, we have uh, we have I mean uh, you know people who have been following neuroscience for a long time would be aware of neural implants as such, which are available in market and uh, in research stages. So, there are implants available for rodents, just like in this image or like in this case. So, you can see the you know the scale of uh, the devices as such. So, we have this. Uh, you know a recording area which is very small and uh, you know this is for a rodent model. So, you can assume the scale uh, you know how big this device would be and then there is a uh, you know electronic module for maybe wireless data transmission of recorded signals or you know even wirelessly stimulating the brain region or uh, the application actually would change uh, for the disease model that we might be targeting. But in general this is may probably the scale at which one implant would be or if you look at the other rodent model I have shown here, it is very visible that okay, uh, the compared to a human fingers how small the implant is right. So, these are for rodent models. Now, in when it comes to uh, human models we have um, you know DBS or deep brain stimulation electrodes which have been uh, implanted for very long time now maybe close to uh, uh, a decade or so we have. Uh, surgeries which are very successful in implanting uh, deep brain stimulation electrodes in depth targets. So, for the uh, you know successful management of Parkinson's disease okay, PD uh, or Parkinson's disease. So, these implants are readily available and you can see here this depth uh, implant goes all the way the connection goes to an electronic module or a package here which stimulates the brain region at very specific time intervals. Then there are other uh, uh, devices also shown here. The uh, you know the the flow would be that okay we will have the electrode okay from the electrodes for maybe um, recording or stimulation anything I mean it can be a, uh, it can vary from application to application. We will have the electrode then we will have an interfacing module right. So interfacing. So, in this case we have this uh, electrode here right. I will just show once again. So, we have this electrode here then there would be an interface circuit here and then a transmission circuit will be there somewhere transmission. So, that uh, wireless monitoring is required. So, why would I would say why uh, we need um, wireless transmission later. So, we will have interfacing then some transmission uh, will be there and then we will have a computer or you know say uh, data acquisition. I would say data acquisition. So, this much process would be there you know to uh, record stimulate and then take data or send data and okay and processing the signals. So, you know the uh, the, um, the amount of uh, uh, you know the signals that we uh, we associate with neural implants is you know in the uh, order of micro volts or less than millivolts range right. So, it they are prone to very much noise and everything. So, 
people have now moved from uh, data acquisition systems that are very remote to uh, on site devices for example, VLSI uh, enabled edge computing and other tools are there. So, most of the processing of these neural signals now happen on site. So, that the amount of data that is being transmitted is very less. So, the analog data that is being recorded from the brain uh, will not be transmitted as, as analog anymore, but will be converted into a digital domain and then transferred across using a wireless module. So, that is how the technology has evolved over the period of time and with the advancement in uh, microfabrication or nanofabrication and you know um, um, silicon based devices as such, uh, the miniaturization has been easier. So, um, the electrodes itself can be uh, you know in uh, the electrodes itself will have the electronics associated uh, for processing or uh, pre amplification or a basic level of processing as close to the uh, recording site itself. So, that is how things are right now. And now, when we talk about packaging, I am yet to come to the uh, exact scenario, so that you will get an idea of it. So, all these uh, things that I have shown are all packages. So, we have devices, we have some electronics and then there is a mechanical embodiment that um, you know puts them all together. So, this is what we call a package. So, I mean in real life we see a lot of package say this mouse would be a package ok. So, um, uh, it has electronics, it has some optical sensors, then uh, it has a wheel and a switch all those things. So, this is a package we would call this an electronic package and now when it comes to a uh, biomedical device it is a biomedical um, a package for you know specific applications. So, it can it will definitely have uh, uh, an interface between uh, biological material or say tissues or brain ok and the electronics. So, now there is also a development in the field of you know uh, what do we call it uh, brain computer interfaces which is all about this thing right. Now, uh, when we talk about packages or what is its importance as such why do we have to discuss it for a course like this. So, what actually is important is that say uh, let us say uh, you know from the point of view of the subject or say it can be an animal model or human ok from the perspective of, of an implant or at the device that we implant for recording or stimulation. And from the uh, perspective of neuroscience I mean there are far more uh, perspectives to be taken care and far more uh, considerations to be taken I am just uh, you know generalizing a few. For example, from the point of view of an implant, it need to provide you know um, very high signal to noise ratio so that the recorded signal will be good, uh, and uh, you know so that we can resolve it into the for the pathology that we are targeting. So so many um, consideration has to be taken care. So the implant has to be packaged in such a way that we the signal to noise ratio will be high. So that is one of the consideration that we always take. Then. See all these uh, devices are prone uh, since these are micro devices that we are trying to implant. They are prone to environmental hazards for say for example, uh, there can be corrosive media that can be dust particles. Say these neural implants that we are talking about will be less than say 50 micron in diameter right. So, um, say for example, we have an electrode like this for recording this would be less than say 50 micrometer. Now, if it is kept open in a contaminated uh, environment, a dust particle can just fall on it. So, uh, Professor Hardik might have already discussed with you about clean room and importance of clean room. So, if a dust particle comes and falls on this, due to this very small size of dust particles, it is very difficult for us to remove it as well. And also, once say we fabricate a neural implant and then we observe under microscope or characterize it to see if it is functional, we assume that it is good. I mean uh, once we get good characterization data, but from the characterization point to implantation while we uh, carry it around if we are uh, keeping it in a contaminated environment it is possible that the electrode can get oxidized or the electrode can get you know covered by dust or some other form of contamination ok or some um, organic uh, contamination or anything like that would actually dam damage the device. And then if we try to record the data or stimulate we are going to get errorous data which we will be able to understand probably at a later point of time after the experiment is done. So, the, to avoid errors for the long uh, so then comes the 
next part so uh, along with the reduction in error of measurement and uh, you know getting errorless data we also need the longevity of implant so uh, maybe when uh, you know uh, the uh, for acute studies there are acute neural experiments and then there are uh, chronic experiments as well right so for short term studies probably we wouldn't need the longevity of sensors but if we are looking at a long term recording say one month or a, a week to start with say or uh, usually when we implant devices on the rat brain or uh, human is a separate case altogether but if we are talking about animal models we might be looking for one week of uh, one week of recovery period after the implantation right recovery one week recovery then followed by maybe a month of uh, i mean data collection right data collection so we need the device to be intact for one month of time so how is it possible to make sure that okay the device stays intact so these are few of the consideration from the implant side okay it has to perform in this this manner while if we are looking at from a subject point of view or you know a patient or animal point of view there are always uh, we are bound by ethical uh, you know uh, we should be following them because we are uh, using animal models for the betterment of humanity and understanding of neuroscience at the same time we should be very considerate about the way we do these experiments right so we should make sure the implants when we implant them they should be uh, comfortable for the subject and also it should be as painless as possible anyway it says invasive process of implantation but again once it starts recovering it should face minimal discomfort and also during the implant i mean long term recording it should create minimal um, uh, you know uh, uh, pain and uh, disturbances for the subject then there is always a possibility that there are chances for infection okay so the key being um, there are bacterial contaminants and fungal contaminants everywhere and especially in animal models which Uh, probably wouldn't but there are chances that it will have its a pathogen associated with itself so if when we do a invasive process it's highly possible that um, an infection can happen and the uh, animal might die due to this infection so a very perfectly designed package is very essential to make sure the wound is not exposed to the atmosphere and any infection might happen so that is very important and this is also important from you know neuroscience perspective that if you think about it uh, some of the uh, studies that we might plan to do uh, would require chronic recording right so that means a month of recording or two months of recording so that means the animal should be alive for a longer period of time so that we can um, complete the experiments as we require so we need to make sure the package can reduce chances for infection so that we can complete our study as well and also many a times the um, a, an improper design of a package can cause to the implant damaging the brain tissue which again can uh, lead to scar formation hemorrhage and uh, ultimately the death of the animal so and also it will corrupt the data that we get so uh, you know so so many things has to be considered while designing and, and not just an uh, you know implantable device but also the package associated with it now um, uh, there is a video here right um, so you can see here a, um, a rodent with an implant in its head right and the wire is the uh, i mean the cable for data transfer and you can see this is a very typical grooming behavior of an a rodent where it will uh, you know lick its uh, four parts and also scratch its head face and the other parts of the body so if you see here it's very um, evident that the animal is always you know restless it's not like human beings you know you instruct them and they would uh, you know listen to it to you but if you can, if you look here uh, you know the um, rodent will scratch its head where the actually the implant is there and the four parts are so strong and you know sharp that it will be able to take out the implant after some period of time so uh, you know when we design the package we need to make sure okay the uh, rodent doesn't cut off the cable or take off the um, you know implant from this spot so many a times during experiments this is one of the 
key concern that we have the implant should stay in the rat brain for a long period of time. Say uh, this is another example where it is not grooming, but it moves around for taking you know uh, water or things like that. So, when it looks around it is a very exploratory animal right. So, uh, it will walk around, it will move around, it will hit its head against different things. So, we need to make sure the implant remains there. So, uh, so whenever we uh, okay, uh, like um, plan to design a uh, package for uh, one of the neuroscience applications, uh, say uh, this is now for one of the experiments that I am trying to show. So, say we have a flexible electrode array which um, I think uh, um, yeah, we will be showing the fabrication of this device during the course of this uh, lecture. Okay. So, um, a flexible electrode array is something that um, you know uh, we will be seeing. So, uh, I have shown you the image. So, uh, earlier we have uh, you know recording electrodes like this may be 33 channel or 10 channel okay. So, and all on a flexible substrate. So, this flexible substrate has to sit in the rat brain here. Now, from the electrode the data has to transfer all the way to the recording module. Again uh, we will be covering it about this recording module in uh, some other part of the lecture uh, course. So, um, the wires will take the data to this module and this module will be transmitting the data to an acquisition system that is sitting somewhere else. Now, again this is not a on chip processing kind of a method uh, because uh, these method I mean these tools which are uh, I mean you know sit I mean or the chips that sit very close to the brain or near the implants are very costly and very difficult to fabricate. So, in our studies we mostly use a wireless transmission system, but a bit away from the rat right. Now, we are working towards uh, on chip processing uh, recently. So, ok. So, if you look at that you can see something known as an EAB holder which is a package that houses uh, some amount of electronics and also the uh, device that will sit in the rat brain. Now, so this is the device that we I was just talking about. It is a 33 channel neural implant. You can see the electrodes here. It is numbered as well. Okay, so, there are 33 recording electrodes uh, which are this kind of circles here uh, or dots that you see. Okay. Now, it is a very flexible device. Why flexible again comes to the thought process of what I discussed earlier. We need longevity of recording right? and also we need minimal damage to the brain. So, these silicon based probes which have been conventionally used for so many years um, are very damaging to the brain even the wires for that fact because the stiffness of say silicon okay, or um, uh, tungsten or any of this metals or uh, silicon uh, by for the stiffness is too high uh, compared to that of um, brain tissue. So, what happens is many a times slight micro motions in the brain itself will cause these materials to damage the brain. So, that is why people have started moving towards flexible substrates or flexible material as such for long term chronic uh, recordings for uh, rodent models and even for uh, human models. So, uh, what you see are the SEM images and the process flow for fabrication of the sensor. We will come or we will discuss about this later on in detail. Now, so this is how the device is implanted. So, you can see here the device being placed on uh, you know the uh, rat brain and then we have the package. So, this is during the surgery what the process that you are seeing. So, the rat is fixed to the stereotactic apparatus. The device can be seen here. Right. And once this is fixed, the package is fixed using dental acrylic to the rat skull. So, now the rat will be able to move around without damaging the device. So, this is how a package is made right, for very specific application to house the electronics that we need, uh, the wires that we need and uh, also the device so that it stays fixed to the rat brain. Okay. Now, what does it entail? So, what total parts are there? So, these are the engineering drawings for this um, EAB holder. So, if we look at it, there, there are 3D printed. So, what we are uh, what we mostly use is 3D printing for fabrication of this uh, EAB holders. So, uh, you know, uh, EAB stands for uh, electronic interfacing boards. Okay. So, these are the this is the EAB here or 
this is the interface between the electrode here. So, this is the electrode. So, the electrode this bend area will actually connect to this PCB over here and this PCB or the EAB will be connected to the bunch of wires that will be taking the data out. So, uh, you know th uh, there is a lot of um, uh, scope in electronic packaging, MEMS packaging and in biomedical uh, devices for especially for implants. A lot of miniaturization and other things are happening over the period of time. So, um, for this specific sensor right, and for this specific EAB which we have designed, we would design a 3D printed casing which encloses them all safely so that that mechanical sturdity will be there which will prevent any damage to the EAB and flexible electrode. So, if you see here these are this is the exploded view of the EAB that we were talking about and uh, you can see here how the profile looks like okay. The surface has been made smooth in the bottom area so that the rat will not be able to catch hold of it while it scratches the head and you can see the electrode over here right okay in uh, here also you can see very clearly. So, the electrode is this that comes through a slot underneath the AB holder. So, this is how the package actually looks like. Now, say we move from a flexible package to a uh, micro needle a package for a micro needle array. So, now micro needles as I said are uh, uh, you know silicon based mostly okay. So, this is a silicon based uh, micro needle right. A silicon based and a single shank. So, uh, you can see a single needle with close to 13 electrodes in it. Now, once this is implanted on rat brain right, then everything else remains the same. So, from the previous package to uh, the package that I am showing right now, you would see a big difference that ok as the uh, uh, you know we also started learning of how packages can be made here you can see a lot of bunch of wires used to come uh, you know to the interfacing module. Then from there we moved all the way to a very thin cable or FFC cable which actually gets connected to the EAB holder that stays away, uh, way far from there. So, this actually enables us to you know uh, uh, make a better package. Also, this is very essential as well because the micro needle as I said is very stiff because it is made of silicon. So, it uh, it is subjected if it is subjected to movement it can damage the brain as such right. So, uh, to prevent any unnecessary movement of the micro needle we have used this FPC cable for data communication. Everything else remains the same the configuration. So, this is the process flow for the fabrication of the micro needle you can see the same image of how thin the devices. So, it is a 150 micron uh, wide micro needle. Now, so this is how the uh, implantation of micro needle is been done. So, you can see the animal is fixed on to the uh, stereotactic apparatus and the micro needle is brought down using a micro manipulator. So, that no error in placement of micro needle happens and then this again this package will be covered. Uh, uh, using dental cement. Now, so this is the package that we had designed and implanted for micro needle uh, um, uh, you know uh, implantation and uh, packaging. So, you can see this is the uh, 3D printed casing for this specific application. You can see the micro needle here then uh, uh, this, EA, uh, this EAB or this is very small compared to the previous one that I have shown. So, this micro needle will sit here and the implantation can be done or it can be brought down like this or assembled like this and these are all 3D printed again. Now, say we move ahead with a uh, different kind of neural implant. See all in, in all the other cases we had um, uh, you know a single uh, micro needle or a single flexible device. Now, what if we have multiple devices like this which has to be simultaneously implanted. So, we have come up with a different kind of an approach where um, you know these surface neural implants have there are two of them with five electrode each and which can be uh, you know simultaneously implanted on left and right frontal lobes of the rat brain. And in this case we were uh, looking at chronic implantation and recording for a longer period of time 
So, that is why the package has been modified so with a backpack so that we can attach it to the rat so that we can you know wirelessly transmit data and long term recording is possible. And also for long term recording it is very uncon I mean inconvenient for um, you know having a wired data transmission module. So, this is something we have developed now. So, we have a preamplification circuit in the interfacing PCB and then we have the implant here. So, so the packaging of the devices for specific applications have evolved over the period of time to the stage we are right now. Now, um, so now when we talk about packaging it is not always just about the uh, site closed implantation, but also when it comes to the uh, say recording modules or electronics or casing for all those you know uh, uh, units as such. So, you can see here the electronic module that we use has been packaged inside a 3D printed casing so that we can keep it very stably on top of a desk and do the recording while we are doing the experiments. Now, you can see here so the FPC cable comes here the interfacing PCB is there and the two electrodes are here which has uh, been implanted and this is the signal uh, that has been recorded from the brain. Now, this is another case where you can see the electronic module that I discussed earlier which has been you know packaged instead of 3D printed casing and then they only the FPC cable will go and connect to the PCB and it has been fixed here using dental cement. So, then uh, we have uh, you know another use case say these are all for uh, rodent models that we were talking about. Does packaging come into uh, an application for actual human beings? So, in one of the use cases say for neonatal hearing screening where we are trying to understand whether there is any hearing deficit in neonatal or babies right. Um, so, we will be discussing about uh, this uh, work in another lecture probably. So, here we have a headband for say uh, neonatals and adults ok. So, based on the head size of the baby or the head size of the adult the package can be redesigned. So, you can see the notches given here which provide flexibility for the device ok. And you can see also a knob here to adjust the uh, diameter of the for, you know to adjust for the size of the head size right. Then uh, you can see that the material has been made very comfortable so that they can wear it without any difficulties right. And then also the electronic module for recording has been enclosed inside a package. In another case say uh, we were under trying to understand the attention assessment system ok. We, uh, so, whether the person is attentive enough. So, for that we need a VR based setup like you can see. So, this is also designed 3D printed you know and uh, tested. So, so many uh, design innovations can be made engineering design innovations can be made for specific neuroscience related applications uh, putting together uh, the skill sets from mechanical engineering, uh, biology, electronic uh, electronics engineering and so many materials engineering. So, uh, you know multidisciplinary kind of a research is actually very helpful. Now, um, uh, as a sample um, I would uh, you know I am going to show you one uh, um, model that we are going to print for uh, uh, you know a this surface neural implant that I had shown earlier. So, this is the model that we will be 3D printing and showing you so that you will understand how from a design we go all the way to uh, printing and uh, realizing the uh, actual uh, object. So, that you will also understand how small it is what is the scale we are talking about. Now, uh, just introducing you to 3D printing which is a very um, very very popular tool these days and also very effective for rapid prototyping and uh, testing for uh, this kind of application. Typically uh, for you know uh, 3D printing has been evolved you know where people um, do 3D scanning using LIDAR or some other tool to create a 3D model of a real, I mean real life object. Then there is a process known as slicing where the uh, 3D object will be sliced into thin layers and printed. So, that is one form of approach. Now, in our cases mostly we cannot 3D scan it because we do not have a uh, predefined model available with this. 
instead we would design itself by uh, you know by ourselves using a CAD software okay like Solberg's or Inventor or software like that okay and then create an STL file. There are also cases where you know people use photo scanning where you take images of an object from different angles stitch them all together to create a solid model but we do not need to go into those uh, details. So, um, from the 3D model using CAD we will generate an STL file then we will slice it and then feed it feed this sliced information to the printer or 3D printer which will print it. It is very similar to the um, you know uh, uh, paper printer, but uh, assume that uh, you know the stacking up of layers also happens than just a 2D plane. Now, um, one uh, you know good thing about 3D printing over the years is that it supports a variety of materials which can be metals or plastics suited for our application. Say if we are looking for a uh, you know metal based say uh, steel or aluminum or titanium. So, these are metal you know metal based uh, you know printing that is possible for these uh, materials. Now, um, many of this um, you know um, uh, metal fabrication have been previously done using casting and other processes. Now, these have all uh, you know many of these very intricate geometries have been now moved towards the fabrication using 3D printing. If you are looking at plastic, we have variety of materials available, we have you know biocompatible and biodegradable PLA material which is very commonly used right. Then we have slightly stiffer version which is uh, ABS, then we have uh, resin based uh, materials which are uh, you know very durable for a long run. Then we have nylon which is one of the lightest and uh, best material. So, so many uh, kind of materials are available these days for our applications ok. So, these are few of the examples say this is PLA ok and uh, ABS then nylon right. Then there are resin based printers ok. So, uh, then so TPU is flexible in the nature. So, depending on our application we choose the material right. So, for if we have some electrical application we can use ASA ok ok. Then um, so, so many different applications are there then metal based uh, process are also developed now ok. Uh, even titanium for implants titanium has been very popularly used as an implant material right. So, this can also be 3D printed. So, how do we print it? So, there are different technologies for 3D printing that are available in the market say one of the common most common one is FDM or fuse deposition modeling which most of you might have seen already where we have a filament ok. This filament will be uh, heated by an extruder or a heater to melt it. So, uh, if it is a PLA is the material that being used it melts around 180 to 200 degrees Celsius. So, the uh, PLA filament will be molten and uh, the printer head or it is like a nozzle that moves around in a uh, x y direction and uh, the stage can maybe move up and down in a nisset direction to uh, pour, uh, pour this molten material at specific locations. So, that we will get the desired shape when it cools down. Then we have SLA or stereolithography printer or uh, DLP or digital lights processing which is the printer that we will be showing today for demonstration ok. Where um, this here instead of a filament that being used here it is a resin bath. So, this resin is a material that is photo sensitive. So, what happens is there will be a bed here right ok and uh, the bed will touch the uh, resin and a laser source or a projector source will be used to shine light on specific areas that we are targeting and the resin hardens. So, um, so this is a different approach. So, layer by layer the resin is uh, being hardened to get the final desired shape. Then selective laser sintering is very commonly used even for you know uh, metal and plastic right where we have uh, powder which will be uh, sintered using laser source. So, there are different different techniques available like material jetting, DMLS, binder jetting and other things we would not go to the details of it. 
So, apart from the uh, you know use of 3D printing for packaging, people have used it for very sensing different sensing applications as well. For example, strain sensors. So, these kind of sensors are usually you know put on um, your uh, say skin or hand to see how much stress uh, uh, you know is taken by the skin and things like that. So, so many research and physiological relevant applications have been uh, demonstrated so far. Then pressure sensors to uh, you know uh, for ear prosthesis have been 3D printed now. Then there are tactile sensors right. So, so many small many different applications and innovations have happened for with 3D printing over the period of time. Then there are definitely neural implants which are 3D printed ok. Then there are also EEG spike electrodes which are printed using uh, conductive material right. So, so many different um, things are already available right. So, um, um, now we would move ahead to see how the printing of uh, you know the demo model has been done. So, that you will get a full on idea of from how to design some you know a package for um, a neural uh, recording and also how to print it and uh, you know try to use it for some implantation. So, what we have here is the preform software which we use for 3D printing. So, it is a, a software that is provided by Formlabs. So, the printer 3D printer that we have is uh, Formlabs 3BL which is compatible for uh, you know uh, bio, bio compatible material printing ok. So, I am just dragging you can drag and drop the part that you want to print in an STL format ok onto the. So, this is the uh, software width and this is the uh, bed size that the printer has ok. So, you can you know arrange the model wherever you want okay, and you can zoom in ok and uh, have a look whether everything is fine ok the way you want. Now, um, you need to orient the print ok so that uh, it comes out well for the application that you are looking at ok. So, for me this seems to be a good orientation in which I can print the material. So, I can keep it look around to see if it is fine right. Then what we have is uh, if you want to uh, scale it up which we would not be doing right now, but if you can you can always scale the model and uh, you know if you want to print a bigger replica and see if it is working and things like that. Then also so um, right now you ha can see this gimbal kind of option to rotate the model as such right. Now, alternatively you can uh, orient to the model um, uh, you know um, uh, what do you call it the Cartesian coordinates as well that is always an option to the planes of the model. But also you can uh, also you know orient in the way that you want in using you can just drag and keep it like that. Then we will move ahead with uh, generation of supports. So, 3D printing always uh, you know of complex shapes usually demands uh, you know uh, supporting structures to be you know uh, used. So, for example, I will tell you. So, right now if we are keeping it like this, there will be definitely you know uh, this is an overhanging feature which has to be supported through some material. So, the software itself has the provision to uh, create supporting structures. So, if you just rotate the model in a different way ok like say like this, then it will automatically generate supports for other things. So, basically the software itself is already optimized for giving out the best structure possible ok. So, um, I am just rotating it back to the way it was. Now, um, you know uh, for improving the addition of the path to the build plate which, uh, or the 3D printing bed that we have here ok. Uh, we can create uh, different types of uh, rafts. So, for example, if you do not keep a raft, so this is the raft structure, this is ok. So, this is no raft ok. So, this will give minimum addition for small parts these are fine or else you can go for mini rafts which are slightly bigger than this for better support or you can go for full rafts which provides better. Uh, uh, you know addition and also uh, better uh, print quality as such ok. Then that is another thing and you can see how much approximate print time it takes. For example, here it shows one and a half hours to 
in this structure. Also, how many layers are there? When you talk about what layers are, so this model, um, uh, I told you, we will slice it. Uh, you know, once the STL file is prepared, we will um, slice it, right? So this is the slicing actually that you see. So this is how the print will progress. Okay. If you finally we will get this blue part that we want, but when it starts off, it starts from from here. So first laser will shine on this much area, so that resin will get cured. Eventually, it will start forming structure like this, like this, like this. Now the part has formed, right? See now, it finally completes like this. Now, if you see here, there are some uh, support inside here as well. So which uh, may not be desirable for some application. So you can untick this internal support option. Then you will not have uh, the internal support in the uh, actual file. But you have to look for you know uh, if there are no internal support, you need to make sure that uh, the there are no uh, if there are any overhanging features which uh, definitely requires support and it's not being provided, there will be a red marking in that area. Right now this model looks fine, so it should be fine to print. Right? Cool. Then uh, we can see, uh, you know, uh, if we need multiple models, then you can always, uh, you know, duplicate multiple models. You need two models, you can always do that. So once you arrange one unit, you can always multiply them. But we only need one, so I'm just deleting the other ones. Okay. Then even the entire model now can be moved around the way we want after creating the support structure. Then we select the printer. So this is the 3D printer that we have right now. Okay. So you can um, connect to this printer right? and then you can always upload the job. So this is the job. So I will just say, I will just um, rename it as head stage and you can upload the job. So once you upload the job, this printer that is connected to my laptop through uh, you know LAN, now the uh, model will go there, and then we will go to the place where we have kept the printer, and we will uh, you know do it. So now you can see that the uh, remote jobs up, uh, up uploaded successfully. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. So you can see that now the file has been uploaded. Now we can go and see the printer. Thank you.